Well, good afternoon again. Uh, if everybody will take their seats, we'll get started. Uh, our keynote today will be moderated by Carolyn Giardino, a technology writer for, among other publications, The Hollywood Reporter. And so if you'd welcome Carolyn, and she'll introduce our guests of the afternoon. Keep talking. Check one, two. There, oh, there, there we, we go. go. Hoorah. Hello, hello. We're all I'm set. Not working. Hello, hello. Okay. So with the multitude of formats, exhibition systems, and technologies that you're using to create movies and television today, uh, creative intent has become a big issue, and that's what we're going to focus on for this session, is how to maintain the director's creative intent. Um, joining me is David Keeley who is Chief Quality Officer and Executive Vice President at IMAX, and Jan Yarber, who is Senior DI Colorist at Warner Brothers. So, um, so to get started, you're both working with a lot of directors on your different projects. When you're with them, do you get the sense that they are confident that their creative intent is being created and passed on? Or do you see hesitation? Do you see concerns from them? Well, I, I think it depends on what filmmaker. Uh, powerful filmmakers uh, who co command a lot of respect from, you know, from the studios, uh, they can do pretty much what they want. A, a gentleman uh, l like a, a Christopher Nolan, a J.J. Abrams, they have big budgets that they can do what they need to do with their DPs. Uh, other filmmakers may not have... Definitely not. Quite quite the, the, the budget talks, the majority of that I feel. I think there's a half a dozen of Nolans out there that can call their game and, and say what they want to say, but uh, what I see and what I get to work on most of the time is uh, filmmakers that have a slim budget and they're being made to adhere to that. And so I, I think that cuts into their creativity quite a bit. Okay. Yeah, Jan and I have been talking about, you know, how uh, how a filmmaker wants to tell his story, and he may want it, he may want to tell it on film, and the DP may want to tell it on film, but for budgetary reasons, he can't do that. So, in some ways, the creative intent might not be exactly what they want because of budgetary restraints. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to divide this up in a few different parts. We're going to start with production and post-production in that area what works and what has a tendency to go off the rails when it comes to creative intent? Uh, I, I think uh, one of the things that a filmmaker tries to do um, is, at least in, in, in my line of work in IMAX, tries to create those, those big, wide, beautiful vistas. Um, and he may want to shoot once again in film, uh, and digital cameras are coming along, but uh, if, uh, if, he's, if he has to shoot uh, uh, in uh, a smaller format or he has to finish in 2K, um, he may want to finish in 4K, but, and then those wide shots look great and they even look better if they're shot in IMAX, but he, his creative intent would be to, to, to shoot in, in, a, in 35 millimeter or maybe the F65 or Ares uh, New 65 or an IMAX film. Uh, and then scan it at 8K and give it 4K file. But I can tell you from the, uh, I've done many films, uh, the amount of 4K masters we get to put on our screens is, uh, I think this year there will be one. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the uh, issues, big issues, for using high resolution too is finding visual effects houses that are willing to jump on the bandwagon that will do 4K or even bigger. Uh, many of them balk at the fact that uh, they have to do it and create visual effects in 2K. And a good point on that too, thanks for bringing it up. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, conversion uh, f uh, for 3D from 2D to 3D. Uh, tell me what's the last uh, uh, conversion house that did something in 4K? It's never been done. 
it's all in 2K. Now, we do a good job of, of enhancing that data, but that's, a, that's another budgetary thing. How can you convert uh, and get enough time to convert 2K files um, uh, in, to 3D in 4K? Um, th there needs to be time and money to do that, and it hasn't happened yet as far as I know. Is there technology that still needs to be developed or, or standards, or what about things like ACEs? What, what's the, the pieces that we're missing? What needs to be done? I think uh, ACES is a great technique. Uh, the ASC uh, CDL is another wonderful technique. Uh, I think with when we say new technologies, to me, that's what's happening right now. So to me, that's brighter screens, B, B chain, if you want to call it, any audio files here. Um, what you view it on, if you see it projected, if it's a flat screen, um, they're much brighter. You're, you're getting into ultra high definition now. Um, where are the standards for that? What dictates how bright is that screen going to be? Um, uh, also, now that we have a brighter contrast and dynamic range going on, what about bit depth? Uh, that's one issue uh, that I see all the time when I'm doing color correction is I don't have enough bit depth, especially in the low end of the image. Um, but you go into uh, creating more bit depth. Uh, if you go from 10 to 16, which is the next logical step, you're creating about 60% more data that you have to handle. And that's a lot of data you're pushing around at 4K. And there's new titles and then there's library titles. So for you, when you're preparing a library title, um, how do you address older films that maybe weren't created for the exhibition systems that they're going to be shown on? Um, quite a bit. There's quite a bit of, of product that's uh, needed for UHD. So therefore, the studios, I think, are being pressed into producing UHD product on library titles. And uh, to me, that gets into a bit of a dilemma. Okay, you have this wonderful contrast and dynamic range, and with 2020 coming along, uh, a little more colorimetry to it. Was this the intent of the person that made this film 50 years ago, 60 years ago? Um, they were pr making a film with the intent of looking at something projected on a 16-foot Lambert screen. Now you're going to something that's almost twice as bright. Uh, how do you handle that? How do you handle that and make sure you still have the creator's intent of how it should look, yet s demonstrate the new technology um, uh, and, and make it a plus and not a minus? So how do you do that? I mean, are you trying to track down people who worked on these? Very carefully. Where uh, possible or what? It's, it's a tough road. Um, uh, I think with the, the extra gain and brightness level that you have, you, you can accentuate and, and try to capture and keep some of the things that maybe the highlight or the, uh, sorry, that the artist could not get uh, the old fashioned way of doing it. So you have now skies that can maintain some uh, cloud definition, um, maybe uh, some specular highlights that now have a little bit of definition to them. But you got, in my opinion, you got to be really careful about it. You can't just go gung ho. You have to keep it within something that still has the flavor of the release print that that filmmaker saw uh, when the film was released. It, I think that's a good point, flavor of, of the release print, because um, we all know that film had quite a good contrast ratio. Uh, we remember the number 4,000 to 1, and as Jan said, it's about the creative intent. We've actually had to live w for the last 10 or 15 years since digital cinema came out with a contrast ratio that, and the black level that hasn't been very good. So we've actually had to crush our blacks. We don't have the detail in the blacks that we had mm -hmm. 15 years ago. So I think, you know, as laser comes along, as we try to adapt these things, um, you, you, the movies we're making today and laser is just coming out, uh, the, the filmmakers didn't have the laser projector. Now they're actually being able to say, ah, I've got blacks back again. I can put detail in my blacks where I couldn't with, with laser, with, with xenon technology. So it's very important, and we at IMAX, we bring, uh, and Warner Bros. also, bring the filmmaker in t to look at this new technology um, and, 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 and learn from that and keep their intent. Um, but also they're smart enough to know that, oh, you can now get uh, better, better detail in your blacks as laser comes along. Um, and so that's a very important thing to always involve the filmmaker as this technology moves ahead. And in bit depth also, we still have not um, got the bit depth in, in digital cinema as, that we had in film, and we're all trying very hard to, to get there. Okay. 
You know, you'd mentioned, you say, you say include the filmmaker with, probably with, the problem with library titles is that most of those filmmakers are no longer with us. Right. So it's hard to bring them in. So you have to go with what references you have in order to, right. to make it the way it is. Uh, if you're lucky enough to, to have one that, that's still around, when I uh, did a restoration for uh, The Godfather, and we were lucky enough to have Francis still around, and Gordon Willis was still with us at that point. And so you, you, we could try with the technology we had at the time to improve upon the image but yet not change the way Gordon wanted it, and he was very specific the way he wanted it. So would that be a good candidate for UHD? Time will tell. Oh. Moving to exhibition, <laughs> you already <laughs> mentioned laser, and light levels is obviously one of, is a big issue as far as uh, creative intent. So what would you like to talk a little bit, and uh, many of you probably already know this, but IMAX recently uh, launched their laser projection system, and if you're in California, you can see it now at the Chinese theater. Um, but uh, what, what role do you think these new laser projection systems have in this area of maintaining creative t intent when we are exhibiting these films? Well, uh, that's something that has happened today. I'd like to go back one step, and it's in keeping with your theme. Um, you know, many of the people in this room sat on the DC-28 committees in the, in the 90s, and we developed a standard of 14-foot Lamberts. Um, and obviously, when people come to our shop and, and, and to Jan's shop and many of the other post-production facilities, they look at something at 14-foot Lamberts, uh, and that is the creative intent of the filmmaker. But I think you've all gone uh, to many cinemas, and we have, as an industry, if we want the box office to grow, we've done a very poor job of insisting that, that, that the cinemas maintain that. Many cinema operators do a great job, but there are some that don't. And I think fundamental in the creative intent, especially in 3D, and I know the spec really was never written, but if you start with 14-foot Lamberts um, in 2D uh, and you maintain that, then the 3D content becomes about three and a half or four. Maybe not perfect, but... If you're lucky. Yeah, but, but if, you're, if you're good at what you do. But many cinemas that I go to start with eight, and, and then you're at two, and that's, that's unacceptable. So I think the main thing that this industry can do um, is to try to get any of the constituency that you know, uh, because you know, projectionists aren't there anymore. Um, how many cinemas do we have uh, in North America? If Michael is here, 40,000. Um, uh, there used to be m thousands of projectionists. There's many not there uh, anymore. So who is maintaining that light level? Uh, let's start with maintaining the standard we set, because we haven't set the new standard mm -hmm. for, for, for laser. Uh, let's tr try to do that, because I firmly believe that people will come back to the cinemas, because remember, at, at, in your homes now, although there's high ambient light level, you've got project uh, televisions that are 30 and 40 foot Lamberts. Mm -hmm. Yet in the cinema, we're 14. That's fine with low. So that's, that's my call to action, really, um, uh, 14 foot Lamberts. And you know, we're writing the book. All, uh, uh, Christy, uh, Barco, IMAX, Dolby on you know, what laser is going to be. But let's get our house in order with the 14-foot Lamberts that we all strive very hard to, main, uh, to, to set you know, 15 years ago. Okay. Um, right now, we also have so many different systems and light levels at, at the moment, that, uh, and 2D and 3D, that we're grading at different light levels for different systems. Um, do either of you see a path where we can have one master, or are we looking at a world where there will continue to be many different versions? The studios want it. Uh, we would love it too, uh, but it, it will never happen, and it's going to get even more complex. Um, but well, I, I think in I don't know, maybe 2025, we'll, we'll everybody will have, we'll have an edict, a empty ruling says everybody has a laser projector that's capable of creating. 2020. 2020. Yeah, that's right. And and X number of foot Lamberts, and at that point, I think we can have one master. Yeah. Nits. Yeah. <laughs> nits. Sorry, old school. Old school. Yeah, we should talk in nits. I'm I'm a yeah, foot Lambert guy too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know we're we're all uh, in the post production community. Um, we we not just from a, a visual point of view, but we've got so many masters. Um, you know, we're in 62 countries. Uh, it's a world standard. So we're doing subs and dubs, and uh, so we're used to 
you know, beforehand we made a North American master, then it wasn't all day and date, but we, we've, we've all risen to that challenge. But I think we'll have, there's another challenge to have more picture master uh, levels for you know, brightness and contrast. I think that's inevitable. We'll hopefully write a standard that, that's wide enough so that we can you know, we work together with that, but one master is not gonna happen until 2025. 2025, yeah. In, the, uh, in uh, doing DI work and, and features, at least with the Warner Brothers uh, motion picture imaging, we master everything in P3 space. So we basically creating one master there and then from that, everything else is created from. So in essence, we do have a single master, but unfortunately that has to be used to service all the other needs. And, and it takes time and money. We, we tend to get uh, one master uh, at IMAX uncompressed DCDM files um, done at 14 or 3.5, and then we use that to uh, adapt um, to the, the other systems. We, we're 22-foot Lamberts, have been for a long time, so we adapt to that, uh, and we've gotten used to that, uh, but now we have laser coming, so there's another master. So it's, it's a complex business. And you, you already mentioned uh, projectionists. But um, what, where is the human component to this? What needs to... Where is the... The human component. I mean, what, uh, you know, is there additional training that needs to happen, additional position that you would recommend, or...? Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm passionate about the, the projectionists in our business. Um, that in, in IMAX, we still, I mean, we still have many projectionists in the booth. Uh, some people think that... that uh, Certain things don't matter in the cinema, um, like ambient light level. And a gr great uh, paper by Pete Luday, um, you know, of the of the uh, exit signs. There, there's no point in having a great contrast level um, if if you don't if you washing it out with what red light from you know for the exit signs. So uh, I think there there is an importance. Um, there is a, there's an idea that the popcorn guy can run all the projectors. Well, to a certain point, yes. Um, but you know, once you change those lamps, you know, if you're jostling the projector around, who is it there that makes sure that the lens you know, hasn't been, been bumped? Um, and uh, I, I just think that the, you know, when we had 20,000 projectionists, I'm sure half of them were you know, just punching the clock and make, maybe not paying attention, but half of them were passionate about it. And I think we've lost something um, to, to think that, that a, a projector, and when a lamp gets changed, who is there to check the 314351? I just think those people don't exist anymore. So that's another thing that, that I find a little bit lacking because the creative intent of the filmmaker can't be realized if, if the white point is off and the, 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 uh, the color temperature is off uh, and the brightness is off and the focus is off. Uh, and who, many cinema, don't get me wrong, many cinema operators have got that figured out and, and do have at least a roving projectionist, but uh, some of them don't. And I think w we're in better shape for consistency. Yes, we don't have scratches, but the things I just mentioned, um, I'm, I think we could do a lot better as a, as a, as a global community of, because uh, we want to get, these, these people in here want to get people out to the cinema. And I think we could do a, a better job of that. But of course, the cinema operators will say, well, who's going to pay for that? I'm right there with you. I have no comment. <laughs> you, you just uh, got Furious 7 out the door. Yes. And that was uh, for your new laser projectors right. as well as the Xenon based projectors. Right. Uh, 2D. Um, was, 3D. And, and three, uh, oh, yes, excuse me. Furious. Yeah, furious, yes. furious was sorry. 2D. Um, so uh, is there a, was there a recent lesson learned or takeaway from that process? Um, but the lesson learned was uh, that uh, I, I love working with the Avengers people and Bruce Marco and, and uh, Steve Scott. Um, we oh, learned. Furious? Uh, I'm Here. sorry. No, I, I'm, I always swear. I, I, I leapt to Avengers, which is coming up. Which we're going to do next. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, no, but uh, I think the lesson to be learned uh, on Furious was we had the world premiere, um, and uh, uh, I think the best comment came out of that was the director, uh, James Wan, who said, it was fantastic, and I, how did they get those blacks? So that, that was really cool. It's on a 90-foot screen, um, and we, we uh, were able to, from the regular DCDM data that I made for our, our regular Xenon, which they loved also, I was able to make the laser master from that, 
And I'm not going to say it was perfect. I think we're all, all learning. But everybody that was there was very happy with it. We had really good brightness, good blacks. And at 90 feet, uh, I couldn't be happier. And then as you point out, the next, we are already working on Avengers, Avengers. 2, getting that one out for a May release. And uh, Steve Scott at Technicolor is the colorist on that and, one. And he's approved our laser version of that. And, and if you know Steve, he's an artist. And uh, uh, you're not going to push anything past him. And he had comments. Uh, and uh, I went and did a, a little wedge for him and got, got it back 15 step wedge of contrast and saturation and uh, he said you got it right on the money so we put that algorithm in and uh, we're good to go so that will that will open in, in a number of our, our laser projectors uh, in a few weeks and was the direct where did the director come in. The, the director was about that the, the director James you know, one uh, was there for for Furious, uh, but the director um, has, has has not seen it. And also we're we're going to uh, premiere our new uh, sound system with with that movie also. So we're pretty excited about that. But this is you know this is just one of the things we do. I think it's really important. Uh, you know, we're, like laser. Let's let's not get defocused. Um, we've got 40,000 projectors out there in, in, uh, in digital, which you do a fine job. It's all about raising the bar. And uh, there's, nobody's about to change 40,000 projectors in the next you know, few years. So it's building on what we've learned from digital. And I think a really important thing is um, you know, the black levels. But another important thing, to go back to my previous point, is you know, no matter how good the black is in digital cinema today, if you've got ambient light and you've got low foot Lamberts, it's mm -hmm. a lousy presentation. So I think we could get people back in the cinemas if we actually paid attention to the standards we built 14 years ago. Yeah. Right. So we have them, we're not following them. Let's, is let's your message. get to meeting the bar that we've created. That's right. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about maybe one of your recent projects in the same way, you know, what, what were the lessons learned? Well, uh, since we're supposed to be talking about technology here and, and new technology and how it helps. Um, I was able to uh, do a film called Queen of the Desert, which hasn't been released yet, and it shot with uh, the red camera, and I can't remember which one it was. I'm terrible at this, but it had... The uh, Dragon, the X? It, my, one of the two. It had the HDXR, I think it's called, or HDRX, mm -hmm. um, which uh, not only records the standard um, uh, full array image, uh, but it also gives you a second exposure for highlights. And from that, you can then blend and combine the highlight information into the standard image. So it gives you quite a huge uh, dynamic range capture. So uh, this was shot out in the, in the desert, obviously. And uh, we had beautiful, beautiful panoramas where everything was exposed normal and the skies were just pure blown out bright. But with this uh, HDRX information, I was able to pull in sky information and uh, make a beautiful, beautiful picture. So uh, camera technology is coming along to a point where uh, it will do nothing but uh, enhance and, and uh, make wonderful images for this extended range with laser and with HDR. And high color gamut. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then the final component is archiving and preservation. And in that case, we know, to quote the Academy paper, uh, we have a digital dilemma. Okay. <laughs> uh, why don't we talk about uh, that aspect and the concerns about creative intent? Yeah, uh, hit it, Dave. Go ahead. Hit it. Oh, hit it. Go okay. Um, I'm pretty passionate about this uh, because, as we know, the digital dilemma says that uh, it's 11 times more expensive uh, to archive on uh, digital media than it is on film. And it's surprising how many people that I meet and probably in this audience have really no idea about that. I mean, you can make an IP or dupe negative and put it in, a, put it in just an air-conditioned office and come back 50 years later, it's going to be pretty good. Um, and I know that because I, I just took a, a, an IP of a movie we made almost 40 years ago to, to, to fly. Um, it's shot in IMAX. Uh, we'll premiere it at the Udvar Heise Air and Space center at Dulles Airport in the next week. I scan that at 8K, uh, put it up on the screen, and uh, Greg McGilvery hasn't seen it yet, but uh, I am overjoyed. It looks better than I ever saw it on film, um, and because we had a film element. If we'd have put that on LTO tape, as I've done many movies, and yes, I know I'm supposed to put it on three redundant 
pieces of tape and every three years migrate it to the next uh, um, the, the next uh, version. version. And uh, I'm pretty passionate about this. I don't have the money to do it. Maybe some huge studios do, but of the big movies, but who are we to say what the big movie is? And then you go to that tape, which has happened to me on a major movie, and oh yeah, load it up, it's fine, but there's 17 frames that are corrupt. And how did I get it back for that major movie? I went to the IMAX negative and scanned it. That's why it's in the movie. So, you know, and there's so many television shows that are made, uh, and, and even f feature films that are shot on film, and then they, they just com they compose it only in 2K, and that negative is never conformed, is lost, and you know, where, where's the 4K version for UHD TV of that? It, it won't exist. So I think if you possibly can, no matter whether you shoot, if you shoot digitally for TV or you, or you shoot for anything, try to find the money in your budget to, to, to make a, uh, if it never sees the cinema uh, and, and a film projector, try to have the money to make a DI of that. And you know, if it's a feature, it's in eight cans. You can hold it up. And with your eyes and God's light, you say, gee, there it is. You need a million dollars worth of equipment to find out if it's really on the LTO tape. So make an, make an IP and put it, put, it in, put it in your air-conditioned garage. In 50 years, you'll have it. Because there's, you know, I think Jan talked about you know, when, he, when he tried to, to get some things from Godfather. I mean, some of it just didn't exist. Right. So you know, we need to, this is an art form. We need redundance. And LTO is fine, medium, but I, I think to try to preserve film and keep Kodak alive for a bit longer until maybe Dots comes along is a good thing. I cannot disagree with you. Uh, we've done many a restoration where we went back to the black and white separations that were made from the right. color negative originally and or shot in Technicolor. Right. And just amazing scanning those black and white seps and then doing a, a digital restoration or re-registration of them, what, what kind of image we got out of that. You, it was you, so crystal clear and bright and colored. The yeah. entry was just terrific. Saturations were beautiful. I cannot knock it. And, and I just want to. Mm -hmm. And um, you did that with uh, Gone with the Wind, and, and I did a little mm -hmm. test of that, 80 feet wide, and it was magnificent and great bit depth too. Go ahead, Rick. But there's a reality, and the reality is that a lot of filmmakers have a budget, and their budget is that big, and they're expected they go out there to make their grand movie, make it the best they can with this amount of money and it's shot digitally, and that's the way it's gonna stay. It's never gonna see the uh, an ounce of, of silver halide. It's just gonna be digital. So um, there needs to be, by those that are keeping these and distributing, uh, a way and a method that they can put these on LTO and also do the homework where every X number of years they have to transfer them onto the next version uh, to keep the data whole and pure. Now. There's problems with that. I've run into them too. Well, all of a sudden there's frames missing. Where did That's they go? <laughs> they went somewhere. So what's the solution? And I, I've only seen one solution out there, and believe me, it's not a, 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 an advertisement for it, but the, the, the DOTS, the DOT uh, system, that's been around forever, that nobody seems to want to pick up, makes sense. It's a, it's a wonderful system that goes on a film base without any kind of uh, organic emulsion to it. Right. and it lasts forever. And right. it's the same thing. You just need a, a light right. uh, to read it. In your eyes. And you're, yeah, and you're done. So that, that'd be important. Yeah, w the, the industry has to find a way to preserve this artistic content. I mean, you know, if, I guess if there was film around uh, when they built the pyramids, you know, we'd know how they built them, but you know, we don't. <laughs> but I'd like to know how we made some but of But it was film. shot on film. Yeah, we might. Yeah. We might. <laughs> So, so there's a lot of work that has to be done that we've been talking about, and uh, one of them is figure out this archiving issue. Um, another big one, and I'll let you make that point one last time, is uh, the light levels. Yeah. Uh, maintaining the, um, the spec that's been created. Yeah, it mainta maintaining the spec. If, if there is a call to action, it, it really is to, to, to let, let, let us uh, come to fruition what we worked so hard with DC-28, getting the 14-foot Lambert standard, and then the regular 3D will look reasonable, um, because I think that the, the reason people lost interest in 3D in North America uh, was that the light levels were, were just terrible, but had they been to that 14 spec, it would have been a pleasant experience, uh, and I think that's very important, and the, the, the projectionist element is another important factor 
I, do, I don't think we, we have the power to bring the projections back, but more supervision after lamp changes uh, for white point and brightness is a real key factor that I think will do us all a lot of good in bringing, making the cinemas more successful, and that'll make us all more successful. Okay. And um, just a quick uh, show in the audience. Um, could you raise your hand if you represent a manufacturer? Okay, well, we have a fair amount. So, uh, David, Jan, are there any other uh, suggestions that you would give of things that, te of new technologies that you would, or, t or pieces of technologies that you would like to see further developed that you could think would also address this issue? I, 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 the, for me, brightness level, uh, laser projectors, uh, it's just okay. mind-boggling what it represents and, w and what it gives the filmmaker in the future. And, and hopefully it's a tool the filmmaker will use artistically and, and not uh, uh, take it to some limits that will be disturbing. Okay. Um, we left a little bit of time for questions, so we have microphones on both sides. And Pat. <laughs> yeah, first a plea. Um, <laughs> ISO does not recognize foot Lamberts anymore. Okay. It's candelas per square okay. meter. So you old fogies We're get old. in the 21st <laughs> century, like me, and candelas per square meter Okay, nits. we're 80 nits, okay? Thank you. <laughs> um, just multiply by four. Uh, Three so uh, two, two questions, uh, less, uh, and I'll only do one if someone else comes up. Uh, first is a question about the legacy stuff, and, and I know, Jan, you've been doing a lot of work with old content. Mm -hmm. And the question is, as film ages, um, I guess the question is, what happens to contrast sensitivity or spatial resolution versus dynamic range? What's been your experience? I mean, same for you, David. As you go and you scan something at 8K, you know, I hear stories where you can scan it at 8K, but there's not the contrast sensitivity there. So what's your experience been? My, my, I'm, I'm doing six movies that we, we shot in IMAX uh, uh, 40, 30, and 20 years ago. And I am shocked at how it's, it, it looks like the, a prints from the original negative of 40 years ago. And I'm old enough to know because I saw them. Um, uh, those, I, are, those are original negatives kept under pristine conditions. No, the IPs actually, okay. under, under, thanks to Patricia and my team. Yes, uh, pristine. Pr pr pristine conditions. Yes, exactly. Yes. Right, but of course, I have also movies that, that have a 65 million movie called A Place to Stand, which made in 67, won Academy Award. There is some degradation on the edges, you know, of the edges of the format. So, you know, there, there's great things about digital because, you know, you can put reverse, you know, um, algorithms in there to, to bring that, uh, that edge contrast and saturation back. So it, it, does, it does deteriorate, but I've been lucky enough that I kept our stuff in good shape. I, on the other hand, have not. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you get back pre-color, black and white, uh, if, if you can get an OCN, it looks dynamite. It's terrific. Uh, it, it's just maintained itself very well. Um, if you're ending up with a, a fine grain, a dupe off the neg that was made way back when, you got some problems because you're missing black information. I found with early color films that we've uh, had to work with, uh, a lot of the time the color dyes are disintegrating to the point that I just don't have any low light information. Um, so it makes it kind of tough and when you try to pull information out of it, um, all of a sudden you just get this well, it looks like a pixelization pattern, but what it is is you're, you're seeing solar halide part, or yeah, it's color dye patterns. Okay, second question, since this is a panel about artistic intent. Many of us remember Ted Turner taking black and white movies <laughs> and colorizing him, driving everyone nuts. Yes. So I know, Jan, this issue, as we look now at going and extracting more spatial resolution or dynamic range out of film negatives, um, it, it, you made the point that creatives had a certain look and feel based on the technology of that time. As we go forward, I often get the sense that many creatives say, well, that was what I wanted and don't go mucking with it, don't do the Ted Turner thing. Do we need a new generation of creatives that aren't you know, unfettered by the legacy of the older approaches and begin to look at it with a new palette and tell stories and new and better ways? What's your sense about and, that? And you have them out there today. You're out, you have your David Finchers, you have, a, you, just, you have a whole bunch of them out there that when they see these tools, they're gonna go nuts and are going nuts with it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you were talking about new material and new, new features. Right, yeah, as you're on. going to a, yeah. into a new oh, yeah. piece of content. It's great, bring it on, it'll be terrific. It'll be a lot David. of fun. And the opposite, and I agree, many new filmmakers 
you know, they've grown up in, in the digital age in, in gaming, and they're going to bring a whole new aspect mm -hmm. of, you know, high dynamic range, high brightness. But then there's the other end of, uh, of the spectrum where it's called uh, medium specif specificity. I have a hard time with that word. But, you know, there are filmmakers, uh, Chris Nolan being one of them, if I shoot on film, mm -hmm. I have to project on film. Like, if you go to the Louvre and you take a, you see the Mona Lisa, that's the Mona Lisa. You take a picture mm -hmm. of the Mona Lisa, that ain't the Mona Lisa. Um, so he, re, you know, he, he's passionate, and, and one of the reasons I want preservation to, to be uppermost in everybody's mind is so that Kodak still continues to get business, so that the filmmakers of the world who still want to shoot on film, and even the filmmakers who want to uh, make uh, projection prints, um, are still capable of doing it, because that is their art form. You know, you didn't tell Michelangelo to, you know, not make David and make a picture. I mean, he wanted to sculpt it. Uh, so the, there are filmmakers like that, and we have to preserve their creative intent by allowing them to do that. And by the way, um, you know, uh, Zack Snyder uh, doing the new Bat uh, Batman and Superman, we are actually doing it, it's not announced, we're doing something in film for him. He said, I want to see that on the big 143 IMAX screen. So let's try to do everything we can to make laser good, and the new Airy 65 is good, the red that you just mentioned. Uh, the IMAX camera, no one still thinks is a gold standard. Let's try to keep all these things alive, uh, but especially film. I think it's something that a lot of you think is dead. Kodak is alive. It's not a commercial for them. Um, but there's great things we can do once we transition. I've, uh, the movies I just told you about, there were scratches in those original negatives. We could never get out. Mm -hmm. Now I can get them out. So there's really cool things I can do because I'm. Sh I assure you, the creative intent wasn't he wanted the scratch right. in there, so I can get them out. Thank you. Yes. One of the so. unique um, <clears throat> new capabilities for laser is the ability to uh, project wider color gamut and more saturated colors. Could you talk a little bit about that as a, a future capability? And Bill, just say your name and Bill. role, oh, please. Bill Beck from Barco. Take it. Um, it I th absolutely, um, you can do that. Um, I think that the films that we're doing right now, the, the filmmaker, his intent was, he, he looked at it uh, at a regular DI facility, uh, and uh, he didn't have the ability to look at those colors. We're ready to do that. We just have to have the filmmaker's intent wanting to do that, because just, I mean, Fast and Furious, I could have, I could have uh, done things with the color gamut, but that wasn't the intent of the filmmaker. So I think we're, we, it's gr the palette we're going to have, and with 2020 coming, it's going to be amazing what we can do. We'll bring more people back to cinema, but I, as a post-production person, can't introduce that because that's not his intent at the moment. I think that's an important thing to remember. Okay, and we have another question. Yeah, back in the 1990s, I saw IMAX in New York City in a theater that was projecting film. And there was even a headset that had spe get special instructions from an audio signal. Could you update us as to whatever happened to that system? Well, sure. I, I, that was at Lincoln Square. It was called PSC. We had two uh, speakers. Um, that has been uh, the PSC system. Um, the problem with that is the headsets were too heavy and we couldn't keep the batteries going. So that we don't use anymore. We are bringing out a new immersive audio system very soon um, to add to the, the six channels we have. Um, on the film side, um, you probably, if you were around and saw Interstellar the end of last year in November, we enabled 50 film systems for Mr. Nolan and an, an hour of that movie was shot in native IMAX. Um, and we still have capabilities in film. We have about 200 museums, um, a, including 60 domes, and we still shoot film for that. Uh, and we hopefully will keep the film um, system alive in, in a, a handful of venues for the foreseeable future. The fact of the matter is that um, a DCP is worth a couple hundred dollars and a film print is worth tens of thousands of dollars and there's not too many movies you can justify doing it, unfortunately. Yeah, the, the, there was a th thinking pattern back in the 90s that 3D would never exist in, a, in longer than a 45-minute length. Is that still, did, 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 are you aware of that? Well, sure, but I mean, yeah. I think we, the, the, the people that really made everybody aware of 3D was Polar Express and IMAX 
Uh, the movie didn't do very well, but our, our 3D version of that, and that started the whole 3D explosion. So I think 3D is here to stay, and I think with laser, um, it will get uh, light levels up to your eyeball that's the same as 2D, mm -hmm. and yep. that'll be a good thing. It's amazing how just a couple of nits difference in a projector <laughs> will make a difference in 3D between just a so-so presentation, yeah, I right. get it, or one that just kind of knocks yeah, your socks off. The cones and the, the rods, I mean, if you get, you gotta be above six foot mm -hmm. Lamberts. And I see Bill, so I think we're gonna be wrapping up. So um, please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.